to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast, where we explore the gospel that Jesus' earliest disciples heard and what the last several decades of historical studies have clarified about this first century Jewish message. Listeners, welcome back to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. I'm Josh Hawkins, and as always, I'm here with Bill Schofield and with John Harrigan. Hey, hey, guys, how's it going? Good. Hey, good. Doing good. Always great to be with you guys. Of course, no pleasant trees in our episodes this season, but hey, <laughs> it's always good to hear you guys are doing well. Listeners, we hope you are doing well as well. Um, we are excited about our episode today. Last week, we spent some time looking at the book of Deuteronomy, and we did an overview of just surveyed the book chapter by chapter. And we specifically looked at some of the major themes of covenant, law, and land, and how those are really highlighted throughout the book of Deuteronomy, which is often neglected in Christian tradition. But there are so many things that are developed in the book of Deuteronomy that are critical to understand as you look forward into the prophets and into Second Temple literature and into the New Testament. So today, what we want to do is we want to look at those themes again, covenant law and land, and how they're projected into Israel's future. Super, super important. Yeah, so we have a, uh, there's a great article by Bill Arnold, um, and he was he was actually an OT prof of mine at Asbury. He's still there, I'm fairly sure, um, but he wrote an article called Old Testament Eschatology and the Rise of Apocalypticism, uh, which is generally good, but uh, just to give a little bit of um, an introductory ideas, uh, Bill says, Israel's most fundamental ideals, both personal and national, took root early in the form of ancestral promises and royal images that became central to the theological ex- expressions in the rest of the Bible. As we shall see, these two streams of thought, God's role in Israel's history and the promises of that history, converged to give Israel an eschatological hope. The presence, then, of eschatology in the Old Testament gradually became more prominent in the prophets and later Jewish apocalyptic texts, which began to appear already in the canon of the Old Testament itself. So he kind of outlines this basic progression that Israel's future is centered around the narratives, like we've been talking about in Genesis, Exodus, uh, and, and Numbers and that this narrative and the covenants that are established in that context uh, give the framework for Israel's future. Yeah, that's good. Or I actually really like that article. Um, what, so one of one of the things that is is helpful about it is he basically highlights two two issues. Well, I mean, he comes to different conclusions, but he. He's going to highlight two issues that I think are really important when you start to think about the the what, what academics or what scholars would look at as the source of Jewish eschatology, and and so you know because you know some schools of thought are you know think that eschatology was developed by the prophets, and others think it was. Not until the Second Temple writers, and others think it was from wisdom literature or whatever. But um, I think, regardless, like kind of what binds all of these groups together is that eschatology must come from these common convictions they had, which were the covenant, one, and two, God's faithfulness. Because if you don't have those two things working together as a mechanism, you do not have Jewish eschatology. Yeah, right. Certainly, there were other pagan nations that had eschatological schemas going on, but what separates all of them from Jewish eschatology is that Jewish eschatology is based exclusively on the dual convictions of God's covenant with Israel and God's faithfulness to the things that he said. And that's definitely what sets Jewish eschatology from from all the other es- forms of eschatology in in the pagan nations around them, in my mind. Yeah, absolutely, guys. So we're talking about God's faithfulness to what he spoke to Abraham in terms of setting them apart, 
choosing Abraham to be the family through which all the rest would be blessed, then brought forward down to Mount Sinai, where God enters into a covenant with the nation of Israel and says, you're going to be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. You're going to be a treasured possession, my treasured possession among all the rest of the peoples. And God gives them the Torah instructions to set them apart and make them different so that they can actually walk in the role of being a kingdom of priests for the rest of the nations, right? So this, God's faithfulness to those words, is what gets projected forward. And we can even see this in the prophetic material, just in a simple way in the in how the covenant is driving contemporary historical events. So for instance, take the Babylonian invasion, for instance, back in 586, when, uh, when the Babylonians came to uh, take Israel captive. And then you get the stories that we see in Babylon, you know, like Daniel is taken to Babylon. And, and then we see in the book of Daniel, Daniel's prayer in Daniel chapter nine, where he's he's understanding from the books the number of years that Israel was going to be in captivity. He's reading Jeremiah and he's going, man, we're going to be here for 70 years. And Jeremiah prophesied this. And he goes, Lord, <laughs> Have mercy on us as a people. We shouldn't be here. We should be in the land. We should be serving you. We should be loyal to you. And why are we here? Well, in Daniel 9, he's explaining why they've been taken captive, and it's connected to the covenant and the curses of the covenant back in Deuteronomy 28. So this is Daniel chapter 9, verses 11 through 13. He says, All Israel has transgressed your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and the oath that are written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. Right? This is just referencing the curses of Deuteronomy 28, Leviticus 26. He has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our rulers who ruled us by bringing upon us a great calamity. For under the whole heaven there has not been done anything like what has been done again against Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this calamity has come upon us, yet we have not entreated the favor of the Lord our God, turning from our iniquities and gaining insight by your truth. So such a clear example right here from Daniel 9 of how Daniel is understanding the covenant and the the reason why they're in exile, the reason why they're scattered is because God is being faithful to his covenant. He says, if you won't obey the voice of the Lord your God, you're going to be scattered among the nations. And this is what the Lord did in Daniel 9. He's, his faithfulness to the covenant is what is driving this particular event that we see. Yeah, that's good. So you have, so that's around the period of the exile. And then, um, and then pushing that forward, you see that this really is a prominent way that Jews in the periods of like uh, the Psalms of Solomon, which is roughly around the uh, the um, the invasion of Jerusalem or the desecration of the temple, rather that happens in in seventy uh, BC. Um, uh, Psalms of Solomon. It's hard to get a concise quote, but between like chapters three through nine, they he's basically kind of arguing for submitting to God because God's actually righteous for doing what he did because of their unrighteousness and because God insists that they must continue in the covenant. Um, but but Second Maccabee 6 actually has a great quote um, that I think really sums up. So Second Maccabee is, is um, it was it was written it was written at some point before the time of Jesus. Um, the, the events took place about 130 years before Jesus, but it was probably written, you know, maybe 70 years before Jesus, maybe a little bit before that. But um, so in 2 Maccabees, they're, they're telling this story, and the author who's, who's uh, rehearsing the story, because chapters 1 through 5 are just gnarly. They're just super, <laughs> like everything is like, Debbie Downer, everything that's going on, and <laughs> it made it legitimately was pretty rough. But, um, yeah. but, and so then the author pauses and he tries to give a reflection to help, to help not only the reader understand what's going on in his story, but how to understand history. So listen to what the author does. This is a big parenthesis that he does to the larger story. He said, now I urge those who read this book not to be depressed by such calamities, 
but to recognize that these punishments were designed not to destroy, but to discipline our people. In fact, it is a sign of great kindness not to let the impious alone for long, but to punish them immediately. For in the case of the other nations, the Lord waits patiently to punish them until they have reached the full measure of their sin. But he does not deal in this way with us. In order that he may not take vengeance on us afterwards when our sins have reached their height. Therefore, he never withdraws his mercy from us, although he disciplines us with calamities. He does not forsake his people. So, in context to, yet again, like Daniel 9 and like the Psalms of Solomon, it's in context to a calamity. And what's mobilized over and over to help explain to the audience what is going on in these hardships is that God's simply being faithful to the covenant. That that explains history. Yep. Yeah, and I think, you know, what happens a lot of times is that people read, you know, the scriptures, they'll read stuff before and then they'll read stuff that happens later on and they might read Second Maccabees six as like a back. They'll they'll read the the Tanakh as a background to Second Maccabees six, and then moving on into the New Testament. Yeah. When in reality, the Torah and particularly Deuteronomy, the covenant and the blessings and cursings curses being projected forward, that's actually the mechanism. For yeah, the driving totally. of Israel's history, it's not a background. It's the center, the heart of the thing that that pushes right. everything that's happening is happening around that covenant and that relationship, and that that covenant is the mechanism for the projection of history moving forward. So as history happens, it's being understood from the context of that covenant not yeah, it's not right. informed by that covenant it's not like it doesn't derive meaning meaning i mean it does of course but it's it's not like background information it's the mechanism itself right that's good right good it's point. like the motor of the vehicle right so i think that could bring up a good question guys like why are they leaning so much in particular why are the, the prophets, why are the Second Temple authors, why is Eliezer and Second Maccabees, why are they leaning so much on the events of Deuteronomy? Because Deuteronomy, as we've seen in our episode last week, is mostly just Moses supposedly re-explaining or rewriting the events of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Genesis, whatever, that, to highlight what we've emphasized a little bit in the past, but I think would be good to talk about here, which we'll just call the cycle, right? The cycle of Israel's covenant breaking, their exile from the land or uh, calamities coming upon them, and then their eventual repentance and return. Yeah, it, it really does become a really important, uh, I mean, it's a crucial way to understand history is because that cycle kind of shows them where they're at. Yeah. and but But it's not for no reason because that the Lord said that they should be able to discern by their by where they're at in the cycle where they're at with him. Yep. And like like if you think of some of the most crucial periods in the prophetic times in the prophetic period you think the exile is, is probably the well all of the events surrounding the exile is probably the most significant prophetic event that happens in the Tanakh during the prophetic period after the monarchy, you know. But um, so when, you know, you think of the ministry of Jeremiah in context to the exile, you know, prophesying the 70 years and, and this, and then Ezekiel being, you know, one of the, one of the deportees in that, in that exile. And, and so what's going to, what's going to happen here is, these guys are going to produce things that have become extremely crucial to how we look back at those events now. But, but what, what we can miss, especially, especially, you know, just honestly, if you've grown up in a Christian tradition, because we kind of look back and we kind of try to see them talking about Jesus, <laughs> right? We're right. kind of looking for, we're playing, 
Where, where's Waldo? <laughs> but but what's actually going on is even even in like the introduction to Jeremiah and the introduction to Ezekiel, there are little clues that this is this is kind of what's going on is one of the big events that happened just prior to the exile, right, is the rediscovery of the book of the law. Yeah. And and so in the book of the law, it was it was likely actually the book of Deuteronomy. Um, but, but whatever, there's a conversation about it. But so like, look here, uh, the introduction to Jeremiah, Jeremiah 1, 1, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. So, so the point is, is that Hilkiah, the priest is almost certainly some people say it's not true because in, in the passage I'm about to read, he was in Jerusalem but none of the priests lived full time in Jerusalem, so I, I and I don't think that's a good point. But uh, Hilkiah is the guy from Second Kings twenty two. The high priest Hilkiah said to Japhon the secretary of Josiah, "I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord." When Hilkiah gave the book to Japhon, he read it, and then he took it back to Josiah, and that's where Josiah like tears his clothes, and they have a national day of mourning and repentance. So. Jeremiah is the son of Hilkiah. That's how the book is introduced. And so when you get to, you know, sections like the inter- the the introduction, his first visionary experience is the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, what do you see? And he said, I see a branch of an almond tree. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. So he doesn't actually say what word he's talking about. Right. The the point is, is that they had just rediscovered the book of Deuteronomy. And so what he's about to explain when he it basically tells him to go prophesy the exile is that the Lord is diligently performing the things he said he would do in the covenant. And you have the same thing in Ezekiel, <clears throat> uh, Ezekiel 1.3 Right, and the th- it, it, this is kind of a funny thing. In the thirty, in the thirtieth year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles, and then verse two says, on the fifth day of the month, the fifth year of the exile of King Jehoiakim, the word of the Lord came to me. And so there's this weird dynamic where you have two dates. They're, they're weird, right? You have the thirtieth year, which has no reference. And then you have the fifth day of the month and the fifth year of the exile. So <clears throat> this is perplexing, and Jewish authors have gone back and forth on it. Um, the uh, Targum Jonathan actually just says all he's talking about is the 30th year. Is It's the 30th year from when they found the book of the law. Hmm. That's what he's referencing, because that's what's refer- that's what's significant to Ezekiel's theology is the book of the law. And so right. like you get passages like Ezekiel 3 1, where you have the the little section where the Lord says, Ezekiel, take the scroll, take what you see in front of you and eat it. And the point is, if you understand that they had just rediscovered the book of the law, then this is essentially this visionary experience to Ezekiel that kind of inaugurates his ministry prophesying to the exiles, is essentially to anchor himself in the book of Deuteronomy so that he can speak from a place of, of wisdom to, to actually help them understand what's going on. So the book of Deuteronomy is incredibly significant and influential in the way that the prophetic material goes forward. Yeah, and it really it binds the exilic prophets together, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel, because yeah, yeah. they're interpreting the time that they're in and the history within the cycle that's created by Deuteronomy. And, yep. of course, Daniel yeah. is coming after. And so, like we read in Daniel 9, immediately following the, you know, the Daniel's description of interpreting what's happening to himself and the Jews as a playing out of the cycle from Deuteronomy, then that's what comes right after that at the end of Daniel 9 with the prophesying of the future, because 
the future comes to a close with the end of the cycle. And so Deuteronomy creates kind of the dynamic of eschatology as we commonly know it, the conviction that the cycle's not going to go on forever. It has a definitive end point. Whereas otherwise, eschatology is just kind of the the end of the future, but Deuteronomy creates the a kind of a point of completion where the relationship, the covenant is going to play out, and then it's going to this cycle of breaking the covenant, the curses, and then the restoration and the final restoration and blessing is going to play out conclusively uh, in the future at some point with Israel's restoration, ultimately. Yeah. Yeah, well, and we can see directly from Deuteronomy uh, how the cycle is going to end definitively. I mean, we get a couple of passages, I think, of Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy 4, this is verse 30 and 31. And we mentioned this a little bit in our episode last week and and how it's connecting to Matthew 24 and Jesus' words about tribulation. But Deuteronomy 4, verse 30, "...when you are in tribulation and all these things come upon you in the latter days..." You will return to the Lord your God and obey his voice. For the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not leave you or destroy you or forget the covenant with your fathers that he swore to them. Okay, so again, projecting this idea of uh, uh, of the cycle, having a definitive end in the latter days, in the future, yeah. when all these things come upon you, you will return and you will obey his voice. And the, the fact that they will obey implies, okay, well, they're not going to disobey anymore, and they're not going to be scattered from the land anymore, and they're not going to be under the curses anymore. Uh, And this even is further developed in Deuteronomy 30, uh, where Moses really brings in this language, and and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, but, but brings in the language of the heart being circumcised. So this is Deuteronomy 30. I'll just start at verse 1. Kind of same idea from Deuteronomy 4, when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I've set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and you return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey his voice and all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have mercy on you, and he will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If you're outcast from the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there he will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possess, that you may possess it. And he will make you more prosperous and more numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all your soul, that you may live. So again, this idea of projecting forward this cycle, that there's a definitive end to it, even laid out here uh, in Deuteronomy 4 and Deuteronomy 30. Yeah, and that, like you said, Josh, it it highlights that language of the circumcision of the heart gets picked up, obviously, by a couple New Testament authors. And so, but you have it in Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 10, The metaphor of circumcising the heart, which is like trimming the foreskin off of your heart, right? The, the unnecessary, you know, the, the stuff that's not good. And, but what you have in Deuteronomy 30 is the analogy is mobilized in a slightly different way. So the, the analogy in Deuteronomy 6 and 10 is the exhortation to the people that they must to turn away from wickedness is to circumcise their hearts. Yeah. And but in Deuteronomy 30 what you just read Josh highlights a different dynamic. It's when God circumcises their hearts and causes them to love him with all their heart and soul. That is a totally different that's a totally different dynamic. And so because really the the uh the dynamic is introduced right because of the dynamic is introduced because of rebellion. That's the covenant hardening, and the, or the, not the dynamic, but the cycle we called it. So you have like the rebellion and discipline, exile, repentance, return, right? That kind of cycle. But the cycle doesn't, the, the trip switch is rebellion. The trip switch is right. turning away from the Lord. And so the idea right. that there's going to be a time when the Lord will gather them after a great exile then circumcise their hearts 
so that they never turn away again, them nor their offspring, it seems to really be trying to imply an end to that dynamic. Um, Jubilees uh, chapter 1 actually kind of references this um, references this passage and or at least the concepts in the passage and it explains it in a way that I think kind of helps understand how this is projected forwardly especially by later apocalyptic writers so in Jubilees 1 verses 21 and 22 the Lord said to Moses I know their contrariness and their thoughts and their stiff neckedness And they will not be obedient till they confess their own sin and the sin of their fathers. After this, they will turn to me in all uprightness and with all their heart and with all their soul. And I will circumcise the foreskin of their heart and the foreskin of the heart of their seed or their offspring. And I will create in them a holy spirit, and I will cleanse them so that they shall not turn away from me from that day unto eternity. So Jubilees, looking back, says, when that circumcision of the heart happens, it will cleanse them and they will never again turn away from me and they'll walk in my ways perpetually after that. So it's a good example of a theme brought up in the Torah referenced in the New Testament, but to give meaning to what it's talking about in the the New Testament, you have to understand that where it lies in terms of the conversation of the covenant and how it's projected forward as it it assumes that it means the end of this uh, covenant discipline cycle. The circumcision of the heart is when the, is when the, uh, the nation of Israel doesn't when God circumcises their heart, they won't turn away from him ever again. Yeah. Yeah, and in this way, uh, apocalyptic eschatology isn't built on theological you know, suppositions. It's built on the reality of the covenant and God's faithfulness and the cycle that that creates. And of course, you know, when you come to the New Testament, the New Testament writers will use a lot of the same language. And so it's kind of, it becomes easy material for Gentiles to say, oh, all of that's being fulfilled now. And the story is being flipped. It's no longer Jewish. It's no longer apocalyptic. It's, it's being universalized and spiritualized. But then you've overturned the basic realities that create the whole framework in, in the first place. Right. right so sure. it, you've nullified the entire equation. And so, the it's true that the cycle of of covenant unfaithfulness exile and return is fundamental to the development of eschatological hope and apocalyptic expectations and so that's what Jesus and the apostles are functioning within but to say that they are fulfilling all of that and realizing all of that then overturns the whole covenantal relationship and turns it all on its head. Exactly. And so yep. the right. I, you know, when New Testament writers are talking about uh, the coming of the Messiah, the death of the Messiah, the forgiveness of sins, the atonement, uh, the circumcision of the heart, they're presuming the cycle is still all in effect and the basic structure of redemptive history apocalyptically that's that it was determined in the first place by that cycle has not changed that, you know, that's the bottom line. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, one of the reasons we come to that is because we, I don't know if accidental is fair, but we, we basically come to it assuming that the reason the covenant dynamic is no longer in place is because the covenant is no longer in place. Right. So when the covenant <laughs> is ended, then then there's no reason for that dynamic to continue. Right. Which is wild because how many passages in the prophets can we quote that the Lord says, if you can break my covenant with the day and the night, if you can search the oh, depths of the sea, well, then I'll cast off the offspring of Israel forever. <laughs> the answer is, well, he's not going to break that covenant. Josh, I don't know if you've ever heard of a guy named Tom Wright, hmm. but he's got some he's got some things you yeah, should read. I, I should read um, it. <laughs> <laughs> Sarcasm. <laughs> um, no, it, it's true. It's true. And and uh, the other thing that this I think brings up in my mind too is 
I mentioned before that there's a there's a lot of conversation about the origin of eschatology in the Hebrew Bible. Hmm. Is it the prophets? Is it wisdom literature? Is it later Second Temple writers? Well, critical scholars very frequently will make the claim that eschatology wasn't even a thing until the, until they were exiled in Persia, and. Um, and during that period in Persia, they actually got the concept of eschatology or apocalyptic eschatology from the Persians, and they brought it back and they rewrote it into their scriptures. But it's it, it's totally different. It's it's not even it's not even so. You have some of the language that might match up, and a, and one or two of the events are similar in the different eschatological schemes, but. They're entirely different because it's not like the prophets and the later apocalyptic writers just envision, envisioned a really gnarly time as history ends. It's it's like for them, everything had to do with the covenant. Yep. And it had to do with the God of Israel who was faithful above all else to the covenant. And that, like John just said, that's the that's the mechanism driving everything. And so they don't just have, you know, these convictions that eschatology is going to happen one day that they borrowed from the Persians. For them, everything revolves around the covenant and the mechanism of God's faithful and God's faithfulness and him faithfully maintaining the covenant. Because like, like Eleazar said, don't interpret these things as God destroying us. Yeah. In fact, he's doing this specifically so that he won't destroy us. He's disciplining us because he will not allow us to drift forever. And so he disciplines to bring these kind of this, this you know, ultimately there will be an end to the cycle, but he, he initiates this, this cycle to call the people back and call the people back to the covenant. Yeah. Not just random bad stuff happening. Yeah. But... But then the end of the cycle is, you know, obviously the entire thing assumes, like John just said, the all like talk of eschatology. How can you read Matthew 24, Luke 21, the book of Revelation? If there's no covenant with Israel, I assure you, you are going to read all of those things in a, and, and you're, you're going to walk away with like black hawks and strange charts because it, because <laughs> it just won't work. Unless the covenant with Israel is the driving mechanism for eschatology. Yeah. Well, and I think you you end up reading those things like you do watching a modern naturalistic apocalyptic movie like 2012 or or yeah. Don't Look it's Up totally or whatever different. you know your movie yep. is. It's just it, it's a random apocalyptic negative reality coming in the future that that may be prophesied in the scripture, but there's no logical mechanism for it happening other than God has prophesied it's going to happen. Whereas Deuteronomy provides the covenantal mechanism for the projection of that into the future. I think a good example of this, uh, you know, peering into the future through the lens of the covenant and the law uh, happens in 2nd and 4th Ezra, the second vision in 4th Ezra in chapters 5 and 6. And so Ezra says, uh, O Lord, verse 23, O sovereign Lord from every forest of the earth. So he uses kind of poetic language, which is kind of cool. But he says, from every forest of the earth and from all its trees, you've chosen one vine. And from all the lands of the world, you've chosen for yourself one region. And for from all the flowers of the world, you've chosen for yourself one lily. And from all the depths of the sea, you've chose, you've filled for yourself one river. And from all the cities that have been built, you've consecrated Zion for yourself. And from all the birds that have been created, you've named for one, for yourself one dove. And from all the flocks that have been fashioned, you've provided for yourself one sheep. And from all the multitude of people, you've gotten for yourself one people. And to this people whom you've loved, you have given the law, which is approved by all. So he's poetically kind of recapping the Torah and and redemptive history, choosing out one people and giving them uh, giving them the instruction. He says, And now, O Lord, why have you given over the one to the many and dishonored the one root 
beyond the others and scattered your only one among the many. So he's kind of playing out the curses in, in chapter 28. And then he says, And those who opposed your promises have trodden down on those who have believed your covenants. Mm. And so then he goes on, and in the next chapter, the angel says, gives the context and the answer within an apocalyptic uh, framework that there's going to be sudden and radical uh, restoration of everything uh, in context to the day of God and the coming of the Messiah. He says, Behold, the days are coming. And it shall be that when I draw near to visit the inhabitants of the earth, and when I require from the doers of iniquity the penalty of their iniquity, and when the humiliation of Zion is complete, and when the seal is placed upon the age which is about to pass away, then I will show these signs. The book shall be opened before the firmament, and all shall see it together. So so the, the main point of what is happening in, in the second vision of fourth Ezra is that the history is moving towards its climax based on the covenantal relationship and the playing out of that relationship in the curses and the restoration. And so uh, the apocalyptic framework isn't something that's just prophesied in a vacuum, the apocalyptic framework isn't even something that is prophesied in relation to kind of the narrative that develops in the Torah. But the apocalyptic framework develops directly based on the covenant and the playing out of the law within that yeah. covenant between God and Israel. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure, John. Well, and of course, this then is not just confined to the prophetic material or the apocryphal or apocalyptic Second Temple material, it also is throughout the New Testament. And I, I think of a passage like Romans, specifically Romans 11, or Romans 9 through 11, where Paul's view of what is happening currently and what will happen is completely reliant upon this view of Deuteronomy and the projection of the covenant and this cycle of, again, transgression, exile, repentance, and return. And without that view of what's going on, uh, I don't know how you understand what the heck Paul is trying to say in Romans 9 through 11. <laughs> it, it devolves into Calvinistic totally. concepts and, and whatever. I mean, so much baggage comes as a result of not seeing the covenant in what Paul is saying in Romans 9 through 11. Yeah, and that, that cycle becomes the presumed kind of framework that a lot of kind of references in Romans 9 through 11, they make sense within that context, particularly in chapter 11, where Paul's conclusions, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable in relation to the covenant, all Israel being saved in relation to the restoration, the partial hardening uh, is in relation to, you know, the the chapter 20, Deuteronomy 28, and the curse is playing out. And of course, it's partial because the whole cycle presumes that the cycle is happening to maintain the relationship. Right. Yes. Right. That they, they, they can't have sinned so far as to have fallen and be rejected by God because that's why the whole cycle exists in the first place. Exactly. Right. That's May so important. Be. May it never be. Yeah. It's really good. Yeah, that's that's good. And another another thing tying what you guys are talking about Romans nine through eleven with not just the dynamic and this kind of view of history, but also specifically to Deuteronomy is that um, in a real prominent passage there in Romans eleven um, is actually reliant entirely on chapter thirty two of Deuteronomy. So. Um, Romans 11, 11 through 16, Paul says, So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall, like conclusively? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I'm speaking to you Gentiles, 
Inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order that somehow I might, or in, in order to somehow make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Then he's going to go on to the analogy of the tree. But but the point is, is if you don't understand, A, the covenant dynamic that he's invoking here, and if you don't understand the, the, the context of the passage that he's invoking in Deuteronomy 32, jealousy means all sorts of strange, arbitrary things. <laughs> Like it reminds me of it reminds me of when uh, when Oprah somebody was on the who was it who was on the Oprah show and she brought up God being jealous and she said I just don't think I can serve a jealous God that's just that's just wrong <laughs> and obviously she's misunderstanding what the word jealousy means in in the New Testament or in the Bible right. but but the point is is that that's not what Paul is referencing. He's actually referencing Deuteronomy 32. Um, So Deuteronomy 32, starting in verse 18, says, You were unmindful of the rock that bore you, and you forgot the God who gave you birth. The Lord saw it and spurned them, and because of the provocation of his sons and daughters, he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end will be, because they're a perverse generation, children in whom there is no faithfulness. They have made me jealous with what is a no God. They have provoked me to anger with their idols. So I will make them jealous with those who are a no people. And I will provoke them to anger with the foolish nation. So two points. Jealousy is God's response to idolatry. That's how God feels about idolatry. So He God doesn't feel, ah, shucks, I really wish I could have what you guys have. That's not, that's not what jealousy means. And so the point is, is that it's anger. Yeah. Is that there's a, so the point here is that you're, when he says no God, what he means is ultimately is this is a God that you're not in covenant with. Yeah. So you're treating these gods in with whom you have no covenant as though you did. And it's making me angry. And so now I'm going to treat a foolish group of people as though I were in covenant with them without you, and it's going to make you angry. And so he's simply evoking this idea yeah. that this is what he sees God is doing with with stirring up the, the anger of some of his contemporary Jews, not all of them by any means, but several of his contemporary Jews are getting angry, especially in the diaspora. Then he says, this is the dynamic that God is stirring them to anger to highlight their need to turn back to the covenant. And so this, the entire thing is based on the entire narrative of how he's interacting with Jew and Gentile here. He says, I'm only magnifying my ministry among the Gentiles that I might stir them to jealousy, that I might make them angry, that they might actually, some of them might actually like just like the prophets would you know would would prophesy and they would go oh my gosh we need to turn back and they would repent and the restoration would come so paul envisions the same thing happening and the trip switch for for their repentance happens to be how irritated they get with all of these gentiles repenting and turning to the god of israel without them like it's not like they're repenting at their word they're just coming and he says this this jealousy dynamic is actually part of the larger mechanism of the covenantal dynamic, which he sees, like you just you just referenced John below, he sees that coming to that decisive end with all Israel being saved and it leading to the resurrection of the dead. Right. And and the basic presupposition that Paul is making, I think, is that these Gentiles in Romans eleven worship the God of Israel. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. Because Gentiles that don't worship the God of Israel don't really matter. <laughs> to right, they're not and, making anybody jealous. To Jews who right. don't believe, you know. In right. fact, it has the exact opposite effect. Uh, right. But Paul presumes that these Gentiles 
are worshiping the God that these Jews who don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that the dynamic is created by believing Gentiles in the God of Israel. So, Right. Yeah. Yeah, John, great points. Great points. Well, I think this is so important to see, as we're going to see how this cycle of, again, transgression, covenant breaking, and exile, and then repentance and return, this plays out not only, well, throughout the whole rest of the Tanakh, and as we're seeing here into the New Testament, but also in our own lives and in in the history of the world. That's right. This yeah. is where history is being driven to. We are not looking forward to some kind of randomly apocalyptic Hollywood scenario That's right. that, like you said earlier, involves Blackhawks and charts and nuclear meltdowns and whatever else Hal Lindsey said in Late Great Planet Earth. But we're looking forward to the God of Israel being faithful to his covenant, yeah. to restore his yeah. people to the land, to raise them up to be the chief of the nations, to be a blessing to the rest of the nations, such that Isaiah 2 plays out, like yeah. the nations will flow to that city to learn and hear the Torah and beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Like that's where this is going. Glory. So Amen. with that, guys, it's been great to be with you and work through this. I think this is uh, probably one of the more significant topics that we've talked about that really will help frame the entire rest of our season here on the Tanakh yeah. uh, to understand how this cycle plays out. Um, yeah. So with that said, Amen. thanks again for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. Listeners, God bless and Maranatha. 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 Thanks for listening to the Apocalyptic Gospel Podcast. For more, visit us on our website at apocalypticgospel.com and follow us on Twitter at Apocalyptic Gospel.